Please welcome CEO of Swift, Javier Perez Tasso. Well, well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here in Beijing. And what a start to the Cybos Week. Well, thank you, uh, Deputy Governor Liu, for sharing your perspectives on financial services in China and for acknowledging the role of SWIFT. And thank you as well, Mayor Yin, not just for joining us today, but for the months, well, years, of preparation and collaboration leading up to this event in your remarkable city. So really, on behalf of the whole SWIFT team, thank you. And it's, and it's that spirit of uh, global cooperation that defines Cybos and our community. And it's something that, by the way, our next speaker, uh, Bill Winters, the CEO of Standard Chartered, really feels passionate about as a critical factor for both growth and the future of financial services. Here we had a chance to catch up before this session, and I can tell you he has some unique views on global trade and the dynamic industry environment that uh, Graham and Sam just articulated. But before we dive in, allow me to share a couple of thoughts on uh, actually set the frame and uh, why I believe our community is very well positioned to address the theme of this year's event, connecting the future of finance. And actually, seeing every one of you here today in Beijing coming from all corners of the globe is actually a testament uh, to the strong integrated financial ecosystem that we've built over the years, and that has been an essential foundation for decades of economic growth. And here in China is a case in point. I mean, uh, World Bank data shows that uh, the, the, uh, the economy is about 60 times larger than it was four decades ago when SWIFT indeed entered the market. And we've also grown our presence here with uh, offices in Beijing and Shanghai, with uh, uh, teams uh, operating there with, uh, uh, of course, a very dynamic and thriving uh, financial community that working closely with SIPs and others uh, are, have uh, accelerated and massively innovated at pace, leveraging SWIFT capabilities. And that has continued to add strength to the international securities and payments ecosystems, which has led us to today where you know, 11,500 institutions worldwide use our network to move the world GDP every two to three days across 40,000 corridors and in 150 currencies, including, of course, the renminbi. And uh, our vision, and we've shared several occasions, about instant and frictionless transactions across 4 billion accounts in the world is getting ever closer. In fact, we can pretty much banish today some old stereotypes to the history books. 90% of SWIFT payments today reach the beneficiary bank within an hour, putting the in-flight time well within the G20 goals. And as an industry, we can go even further. Having ISO 2022 across the community will drive a major uplift in data quality, which is an essential component for an even better end client experience, but as well, stronger compliance and, of course, innovation. Innovation that is rapidly accelerating here in Asia, as in other parts of the world, where we're seeing big advancements in uh, technologies and business models that, uh, face it, are truly transforming the landscape. Because the reality is, in, in the future, there will be many more ways to move value, not fewer. And people will demand more choice, not less. So an area that we're very much focused on is how our network can be used to exchange, to transfer tokenized value across public and private blockchains, as well as uh, to interlink CBDCs globally with SWIFT as a single window, creating an end-to-end -end tracking, transparency, traceability, and trust across all transactions. And that, whether, you know, uh, they, whatever form they take, uh, the networks they use, 
or how they settle. But actually, technology is very often the easy part. Security, scale, governance, uh, resilience, these are all much harder. Operational excellence, risk and control cannot come as an afterthought. So when I talk about the value of the strong integrated financial ecosystem that we've built over the years together, well, the assets of the SWIFT platform can be leveraged as an international public good to integrate and connect the future of finance. And that's why I always find Cybos so energizing, to exchange and debate on topics that really matter to our industry. And who better than Bill Winters to kick us off this week? So please join me in welcoming Bill to the stage. Let's start with a, with a wide lens uh, first. I mean, you're the CEO of a, of a bank operating in 53 markets uh, globally. Um, so, and, uh, and we'd like to hear your views about the bigger picture, the global perspective, and what are the key drivers maybe over the next six to 12 months? Yeah. Well, I think we, we, we start every day uh, thinking about the environment in which we operate. And uh, I know I've, I've shared with my colleagues that I, uh, I wake up every morning, I open up whatever news feeds we've got, and I wonder what horrible thing happened overnight. And uh, thankfully, not too many of them are affecting our business too directly. But then we enjoy a day where things are, I won't say as good as they can get, but things are very good. Let, let, let's, let's, be, let's be honest with ourselves that the global economy is in very good shape. Growth is probably uh, a little bit higher than what we would consider to be normal or, or potential. And that's against the, the backdrop of, of years of steady evolution. Uh, the business environment has been pretty good for banking with interest rates and in something of a sweet spot. Uh, and we can spend the day thinking, ah, things are actually excellent. And if I'm uh, anything like many of you, I think, I go to bed at night worrying again that something horrible is going to happen overnight. And in, in, my, in my years in banking, which is it's getting to be, uh, it was 40 years, I'm, I have to admit it, uh, in banking, uh, I've always found that you've got good and bad in every day. But, but right now, it's, it's, uh, uh, I'd say the, the, the two poles are about as, uh, about as wide as they could be. Uh, but along the way, we're going to manage the, the, the tail risks uh, as best we can. We've done very well so far. Uh, and we're going to enjoy and, and promote those, those, the, the middle part of our day, which is running our businesses, uh, where things are actually going very well. Yeah. No, it's a great, great way to, to frame the discussion and to, and to set this up. Maybe let's jump into a topic that I know is close to your heart, of course, uh, uh, trade, global trade in general, and how's the, how it has evolved over, over the years, particularly after years of globalization. I know in this room, obviously, it's been a big driver for businesses and banks. Uh, over the years, and a great contributor to, to, to wealth. Uh, recent reports, we were discussing about it, uh, of the dual UTO, uh, uh, that uh, income per capita has increased 65% uh, over the last 30 years, and almost tripled in low-to-income low countries. And that, where global trade has been a key contributor. So you, uh, uh, being the CEO of a leading trade bank, uh, what are your thoughts on, on global trade, and particularly on globalization? And yeah the future there. Yeah, we, we, we know the story. Uh, trade has lifted, uh, by many measures, two billion people out of, out of poverty. Uh, globalization, broadly defined, has been a, a really good thing for humanity. Uh, we also know that it left uh, very, very important pockets behind in, in different ways. Uh, and we know that it, that it presented enormous challenges in terms of, of connecting a world that historically has been fragmented and has forces that are pulling towards fragmentation again. Uh, this idea that globalization is somehow dead or, or in reverse, I, there's, there's no evidence of that from what I see. Trade is continuing to grow and, uh, and will continue to grow for, for many years ahead, I believe and, and, and we believe. Uh, but the, the nature is changing fundamentally and, and we've seen all the, uh, the indications of that uh, here while we're in, in Beijing and in China uh, and around the rest of the region, rest of the world. So we know that, that the trade flows are, are increasingly uh, shifting. Uh, we know that the supply chains are diversifying. We know that there are new points of friction. Uh, we know that there is fragmentation uh, that's occurring. It's, it's coming uh, on the back of geopolitical tensions. It's coming on the back of ordinary core supply chain reconfiguration of, of uh, cost patterns that have shifted across markets. And uh, I think the, the, the key for us as, as banks, as intermediaries in these flows of trade, 
is to recognize the trends and do our best to be in front of them. And that's certainly what, what we've been trying to do at Senator Trotter, uh, which is uh, recognizing there's a huge amount of intra-regional trade uh, that is displacing some of what had been inter-regional yeah. trade. The intra-regional trade within the Asian region, where we're sitting right now, is booming. Uh, the trade between, I, I don't particularly like the term South-South, uh, because it's not geographically correct, but uh, we know what we mean by uh, trade between Asia, uh, South Asia, Middle East, Africa, Latin America, is booming. Uh, but we know that there are forces of, of uh, protectionism or reconfiguration that are, that are taking root as well that will slow down trade in some contexts. Uh, when, I, when I think about what we're, what we're doing here at, uh, at Cybos and, and what you do, Javier and Swift, and, and you're doing excellently, it's, uh, it, it's creating that, that network that can adapt continuously to these shifting trade and, and financial trends, uh, anticipating as best we can both the restrictions on, on the flow of goods and, mm -hmm. and services and funds, uh, but also the opportunities to, to, to make sure that we continue to facilitate this, this growth. So I'm, I'm, I'm delighted, by the, certainly by the conversations I've already had, uh, and I know that we will have in the remaining days of Cybos. Yeah. No, no, it's true. And, and maybe, you know, one of the conversations we had before the session, you know, to spice things out uh, a little bit, I mean, there are one of the questions that everybody has in their minds is all of these, um, you know, kind of initiatives that are, you know, being created uh, a little bit all over the all over the world that, you know, have massive benefits in terms of innovation and and and, uh, and achieving even uh, bigger objectives uh, to what the ones you were referring to, but uh, at the same time there are some risks involved about potential fragmentation and uh, and lack of interconnection uh, interconnectedness among them and therefore you know, uh, potential impacts into the world economy. You know, some studies say that even some countries uh, could be going to reverse gear because of technology fragmentation. So what are your thoughts there? Yeah, you know, as, as Javier, and I, Javier and I had many conversations uh, over the years, but, but certainly leading up to, to today. And, uh, and I thought you captured the, the essence of, of what is SWIFT in your comments up front. Uh, in a way, I, I might have even a slightly different view of, of what is SWIFT. Uh, sometimes we refer to SWIFT as a messaging platform or a payments platform, which of course it is. Uh, sometimes we refer to it as a technology platform, uh, which it is. Uh, maybe what we should think about SWIFT as being is, is a movement. Uh, and by a movement, I mean uh, a, a, a culture, uh, a, uh, a very flexible group that can interact to make sure that the world, which is facing tremendous forces of fragmentation, can remain connected. Uh, and of course, at, at the heart of that will be technology. And in fact, many technologies. And in, in your comments up front, you mentioned uh, everything from CBDCs to, to uh, other uh, digital assets or, or tokenized real assets. Uh, we know that, that the, the things that are moving around uh, come in the form of uh, fiat, uh, non-fiat currencies, uh, securities, etc. Uh, we know that they're facing a, a panoply of different technical requirements, uh, different compliance requirements, uh, in many cases structurally different regulatory requirements, not to mention the fact that the data infrastructure of the world itself is fragmenting. Uh, we all understand that. Senator Chartered uh, has many home markets. Uh, we have many home markets. The, the 53 that you mentioned and the other 70 markets that we serve from the 53, they're all home markets for us. Uh, our real home market is the globe. That's our home market. And let's be honest, not that many of us have a primary home market, which is the globe. M most of you have a home market that's, that's quite strong in and of itself. So we, have a, we at Senator Chartered have a real vested interest in making sure that the globe stays connected. That is the essence of SWIFT. And if we think of SWIFT as a technology platform, uh, we'll always feel a little bit uh, unsatisfied because the technology will never be perfect for the future. We can make it perfect, but it won't be perfect where we start. If we think of SWIFT as a movement, then we can all pile in to that movement because we have that common interest in making sure that a fragmented and fragmenting world stays connected. Yeah, well said. And, uh, and indeed, I mean, you could say we could go for hours on that, uh, on that uh, discussion because it's, anyway, one of the, and by the way, Standard Chartered, I'm not the only one, but uh, you're here, so I mentioned you. You are a, a one of the leading banks in, in actually um, leveraging many of the innovations that were taking place right now at, uh, at SWIFT. You know, we're about to move into live trials on multi-ledger, DVP, PVPs. 
um, also um, you know the trade finance I mean and, and embedding electronic bills of lading into I mean being uh, initiated in blockchain uh, uh, networks into you know the uh, the end-to-end -end bank transfers uh, that uh, that are part of the letter of credit. So all of that, all of this interconnection uh, of uh, of networks that at the end leverage that movement of uh, of a common good that uh, that has the, the controls that you demand from an industry-owned uh, cooperative, right? Right. So l l let's. Uh uh, maybe if, if you're comfortable doing so, Avery, we'll, we'll talk about the, the way that, that SWIFT is contributing to innovation. Uh, we all see how SWIFT is responding to innovation. So when, when, when new instruments are created, uh, new flat form, platforms, uh, new forms of connection between uh, people moving currencies, moving goods, moving services, uh, SWIFT is responding very quickly to provide the infrastructure that's safe, that's reliable, uh, that, uh, that has the security features that we all value. Uh, I'd love to see SWIFT continuing and, and, and even beginning to, to, to more aggressively promote innovation itself. Uh, you can't be the sole innovator. I think every one of us in this room needs to be an innovator continuously. That's, that's, that's the, the nature of our business. But, uh, but, but SWIFT can contribute to that. You know, I'm, I'm going to reflect on a, a, actually a, a comment that came from, from one of, uh, uh, actually a former regulator, but a, but a very esteemed former regulator earlier this week in, in a different session. Uh, who, who uh, made a comment to a number of banks, I, I know a number of you are in the room, that uh, you banks, you're in trouble. You're in trouble because your job is to intermediate flows in the financial markets. But uh, with the advent of, of uh, blockchain technology and, and digital assets and central bank digital currencies and all the things we're talking about, there's going to be no role for your intermediation services any longer. Uh, and you're basically going to be out of business. I said, okay, that's, a, that's pretty bleak. Uh, now, when I, when I reflect back to uh, the history books and, and think about what people might have said about banking 150 years ago, uh, they would have said the same thing. Uh, you know, when, uh, with the advent of the telegraph, uh, the, uh, the idea that, that bankers' drafts, which were transmitted by, by uh, a horse and wagon and then shipped from one place to another with perhaps some gold bars or, or, uh, or some other banknotes being exchanged, with the advent of the telegraph, that all went away, and, and there was uh, you know, the beginnings of SWIFT, in fact. Uh, but you know, I don't have to remind you that 150 years later, we're all still here. Uh, not only are we here, we're bigger than we've ever been, we're more important than we've ever been, we're also more regulated than we've ever been, and, uh, and there's a reason for that, because the role that we play is absolutely indispensable in the context of global finance. Now, are we going to be doing the same thing 150 years from now or 150 months from now? that we're doing today? <laughs> Definitely not. Uh, definitely not. Uh, we're going to find new ways to serve this economy because we have the clients who trust us. We have the knowledge of how to connect financial markets to each other, but also to the governments that are supposed to, supporting us and hosting us. Of course, we do many things other than facilitate payments and intermediate credit. We're also the front line in the fight against the natural crime. We're the, the primary fighters against money laundering and, uh, and uh, associated issues that are very important to each of our host governments. We also know that each government has a different set of rules and a different set of objectives, which we need to accommodate. So when I think about the, the future of banking, and I know this is a, a big, this is a title of, of, uh, of this whole cyber session, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that the role of banks, assuming we discharge our responsibility well, will become increasingly important, not decreasingly. Oh, but of course, if we focus only on what we did yesterday and trying to do that a little bit better and hold on to things that, from, a, from an innovation perspective, are moving away, well, of course, then we won't be here. And some organizations will disappear, let's be clear. Mm. Some won't accommodate the change. Some either don't have the resources or will make mistakes. That's always been the case. Uh, but for uh, an organization like SWIFT, uh, that's been around for decades, for uh, a bank like Standard Chartered that's been around for 170 years, I'm, I'm quite confident that we have a very, very, very strong and compelling role to play for yeah. years to come. No, no, well, well said, and, and indeed, I mean, it's, it's that innovation with uh, very strong foundations that makes our ecosystem what it has, uh, what it has become. You know, innovating with uh, controls, with uh, uh, compliance, AML practices, cyber resilience. These are not, you know, mm. second-hand priorities. So maybe a point on, in, on, on innovation, but more zooming into some of the themes as well that were mentioned earlier on by Graham and Sam. Um, 
you know, uh, obviously, most of us, I'm going to be discussing this week about uh, quantum uh, AI, clearly very high on SWIFT's agenda. I know your leadership team is very much focused on, on those and others. Can you let us know a little bit what is in your radar and how are you tackling those? Yeah, I mean, we're all, we're all uh, I won't say struggling, because it's, it's actually super exciting to think about how we embed AI in everything that we do. And I, I guess most of us have some pretty well-established uh, protocols typically starting with compliance. I know in our case, probably going back almost a decade, we were using uh, large language models to, to inform uh, our financial crime capabilities. And those were evolving and evolving. And of course, there's more and more data and more and more computing, computer power, computing power. Uh, the, uh, you know, we can imagine the quantum leap that will come with quantum computing. Uh, probably the most reassuring uh, thing I've uh, discovered, if I could say that, in the past couple of years is uh, I always had the, 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 the mis misunderstanding that when quantum computing really took off, that the guy that had the first quantum computer uh, would be able to crack all of our codes and there wouldn't be much that we could do about it if we didn't have our own quantum computer. And I've become assured, I hope that you agree with me, uh, that we can put the defenses in place today uh, so that our encryption technologies will be safe and sound, uh, but they require a very significant upgrade, which needs to start now if we think that quantum computing is likely to be a feature uh, in the next uh, five to ten years, which is, which is our understanding. Uh, but uh, the, the huge shift that's, that's uh, come in the last uh, year and a half or two years has been the, the advent of mass, mass available uh, generative AI. Uh, we took the view early on that we really needed to start with defense and that we could build the offense off the back of our defense platforms. And uh, the first form of defense for us was making sure that we had the ethical configurations in place so that we have the, the appropriate uh, vetting processes to make sure that we're not embedding uh, historical biases or, or, or inaccuracies into the way that we're using AI. Uh, as I mentioned, we've, we've gone sort of full speed into using uh, AI for, uh, for, for the defensive fraud protection, uh, compliance configurations, et cetera. Uh, and we're all beginning now to really tap into the productivity tools that, that, that AI and Gen AI present for all of us. Uh, and we know that that can be dangerous. Uh, so you see very little coming out of banking that's correct, directly connecting to clients yet, but it will. Hmm. And maybe it won't come from banks. Uh, maybe it's going to be a fintech or a, a data tech startup that's going to be offering uh, our services directly to customers in order to circumvent the use of banks at all. So, so back to my, my regulatory, regulator friend who said you know, we're all about to become dinosaurs. Uh, but we've shown again and again and again in banking uh, that while we're not always the first to the great customer serving innovations, and think about some of the, the great innovations of payments have actually come from outside of banking, uh, they still connect through to the banking system. We serve those, those tech companies or fintech companies. Uh, we partner with them. Sometimes we acquire them. Eventually, at point they, some point, they may acquire us. That's fine. Uh, the, the key is that we're keeping pace with our own investment, that the things that we do really well, and, and, and Javier, you, you said it very clearly already, our knowledge of what, what security, techno te te technological resilience, understanding multiple regulatory environments, these are things that we know really well yeah. uh, and that give us a very, very strong relevance, even in a, in a, a world where uh, we, we can see uh, AI-driven machines or uh, quantum-driven tech companies taking big chunks of our market, there's still a key role for us to play. Yeah, uh, definitely right. And, and indeed, I mean, we've been in, and we've been having together and with some others as well, innovations on AI, I mean, recently on fraud detection. Indeed, we've been experimenting ourselves as well uh, on AI for years now. And, uh, and coming with uh, AI-powered fraud detection tools that, uh, that uh, can provide anomaly detection services to new levels in the account to account space. So, so, so definitely a space that will continue to develop. Um, Maybe one last qu qu question uh, on, on um, you know, we've been talking about the digital economy, of course, uh, uh, but beyond that, increasingly in the physical world, there are common challenges that we you know, and I know it's, it's an area that you spend a lot of your time uh, as well, like, uh, you know, uh, climate change and how could we make any progress there. So how do you see the interface between the digital economy and um, sustainability? Yeah, I, I, I often get the question, I think we all do, uh, how we reconcile being a purpose-led organization with a very heavy focus on sustainability with our profit objectives. Oh, well, th there's no conflict at all. Uh, we, we made clear very early on that we would be, as best we can, leaders in the thought process around sustainability, sustainable finance. We have our own net zero commitments, which are quite advanced. 
Uh, and we also said we're going to make a lot of money doing it. Uh, and I'm not ashamed to say that. We, in fact, we set a very specific target that we would make $1 billion of incremental income by 2025. Uh, and we're on track to do that. We made $850 million last year. Uh, and that's by providing financing in the markets that we serve most closely, Asia, Middle East, and Africa, uh, with a full range of, of transition finance projects. I think it's a, it's a huge growth opportunity for all of us. Uh, we know that, that the, the financial markets of the future will actually consume more and more power. That's the, the nature of things. We've talked about AI. And, and uh, therefore, we know that we have to redouble our efforts to, to be sustainable. And we need to do that in a way that, that's serving our customers in a way that we generate a decent return. You know, I've always had the view, uh, our financial community broadly defined, let's call this part of the movement, we can do anything if we believe that we can deploy capital and get a decent return. And th there's no reason that we can't get a decent return in this area, and in fact, we are. Yeah. No, it's, uh, and in any case, well, that is one of the, the themes, or one of the topics that has become prime at Cybos over the years, and we'll be having a lot of this uh, topics through, throughout the, throughout the, the conference. Um, well, at the end of the day, I mean, it's, uh, any parting thoughts from you before you, I know you need to head out uh, uh, later in the week. Uh, you know, it's, it's great to be here. It's, it's fabulous to be in Beijing. Uh, I'm, uh, I, given our business here, I get here very regularly. I know others, uh, this is an unusual visit. And I hope you're really enjoying the, the, the splendor of this city and the magnificence of the country, uh, which I believe is on very, very much on the right track. And of course, uh, it's fantastic to see this gathering. I think you've got 10,000 plus yeah, people registered uh, to talk about how we stay connected. And you know, Javier, I think you've, you've done a great job of leading the SWIFT organization. If you can help us to lead this movement uh, to make sure that the finance community is, is helping us remain connected in a fragmenting world, uh, I think it, we'll all be better off. So well, thank you and, and thanks well, to all thank of you. you. Thank you.